Ohio was hardly a state, and Columbus no more than a village, when they laid out the plans for this medieval prison. John Quincy Adams was president of the United States that year. These graying, weathered walls have looked out over the Scioto River for most of this nation's history. That qualifies it for museum status. But museums are places where the dead artifacts of the past are placed. Within these walls are 4,000 men who are the living dead. This is the Ohio Penitentiary. It is not the only prison in the state, but it's the oldest, the biggest, and the ugliest. And it bears a striking resemblance to many other ancient prisons in this nation. It's 22 acres in size and two blocks from downtown Columbus. It cost $93,000 to build in 1832, and the taxpayers have been paying millions to keep it running ever since. More than 125,000 men have disappeared behind these walls in the last 140 years. A few of them were notorious criminals, but most of them passed behind these walls without notice. They committed crimes, were caught at it, and finally sentenced to prison. As far as the public was concerned, that was the end of that. But it really wasn't the end, either for the criminal or the public. It was, in fact, just the beginning. For the convicted man, the beginning began here and went on for 10 or 20 years or a lifetime. For the public, it was a beginning too. For the next 10 or 20 years or a lifetime, it would pay the bills to confine, feed, and clothe thousands of men. America built the first prison systems in the world, and this was one of the first. The basic idea from the start was to reform the criminal. But right from the start, it has largely been a failure. Very few persons know what goes on in a prison, and they are happier not knowing. It is, after all, not a very pleasant story. But this is that story, and down below is the cast. It is made up of robbers, thieves, murderers, and forgers. But most of all, it is made up of human beings, made in the image and likeness. This is where they live. It's old, antiquated, outdated, and dangerous. That building over there is part of the notorious history of this place. It's known simply as G.H. April 21st, 1930. It was known across the nation and around the world. On that night, inside that building, 322 men burned to death in their cells. It was one of the worst fires in American history. Wooden scaffolding kindled the flames into a human inferno. Fury, indignation, and investigation followed. The building was rebuilt with fireproof cement and steel. But the lesson learned was soon forgotten. Now, today, they say it can't happen again. But prison officials know it can. It can happen in fireproof buildings like 3, E, and F. The walls here are fireproof, but the contents are a tinderbox. The contents are bedding and clothes, cram jammed together in what the optimists call a dormitory. They live 80 to 120 men in a room this size. They sleep in double stacked bunks so close together that two men cannot pass each other in the aisle. Their clothes hang from wires strung over their beds. Fire could rage through this room in minutes. Violations of state fire laws are everywhere, not to mention the infractions of the state health code. This and eight dormitories like it may be fireproof, but they are at the same time fire traps. Not everything in this prison is as ancient as John Quincy Adams. Some of the buildings were built in the Abraham Lincoln era. Others were remodeled about the time Rutherford B. Hayes was in the White House. But even if the buildings have remained unchanged, other things within the walls are different. The wardens of the 20th century have abolished the brutality of the past. 
and the men no longer are forced to march the lockstep, which meant each man marching with his chest against the back of the man in front. There are no more striped uniforms or prison numbers across an inmate's shirt. And after the 52 riot, the strict rules about talking and smoking were relaxed. The James Hospital, although built in the last century, uses the most modern medical treatment and equipment. Plastic surgery is performed on men here who may have turned to crime because of their deformities. And within this hospital, prisoners have volunteered to take live cancer injections in the hope of finding a vaccine against this killer of mankind. God is in this prison too. This place has never been without a chaplain. The warmth of religion can be felt within this Catholic chapel put up by the prisoners themselves. The word penitentiary comes from penance, which was the early Puritan idea of prison, a place in which a man might reflect upon his sins. The cross atop this chapel is the only angle from which a prisoner can see the outside world. Near the center of the yard is the Protestant Jewish chapel. Hymns and praise of God reverberate across this auditorium each Sunday morning. On Saturday afternoon, it's a movie theater. And during an occasional afternoon for an hour or two, the Good Shepherd looks down on this darkened auditorium filled with strange and eerie sounds. The prison musicians practice here. Like musicians everywhere, they are off alone in a world all their own, oblivious to all the rest. didn't used to be a gymnasium here until they knocked out part of an old cell block. It's pretty small for 4,000 men, and the time that each man can be here is equally small. But this gymnasium isn't really recreation. It's a place to keep the weakened body strong. It's a place where a man can lift weights until he's tired enough to sleep at night. It's a place to wear the body out so the mind can rest. It isn't much, but it's better than nothing. The dining hall isn't much either. It's an endless succession of foot-wide tables. And during the short 20-minute periods when the men eat, it's full of the sound of stainless steel cups and silverware and rushing. Three times a day, 4,000 men march in here, pick up a tray full of food, and file down between the narrow rows of tables. Collapsible stools are the chairs, and they're so close together that each man's shoulder presses against the next. After a while, a man can learn to push the food to his mouth without lifting his arm. The food is not bad, but many have trouble digesting it because they get so little exercise. When the bell rings, everybody gets up and gets out. It's one more example of crowding everywhere all the time. But for some men, this 20 minutes of shoving down a meal in a jammed auditorium is a precious time. It may be the only time they're let out of their iron-barred cells all day long. These men are the idle. The idle are just what the term implies. For them, there is no work and little recreation. They may be too old. They may be incapable of working, or more often than not, there just isn't any work for them to do. There are 900 men who are idle all day, every day. They spend 20 of the long 24-hour day locked in their cells, left to themselves. They are more victims of the ever-present crowding. There are other men locked in their cells all day long besides the idle. Within the ancient buildings marked A-B block is a special row of cells. No one ever sees these men, not even the other prisoners. They can be found behind double and triple steel doors in what's called L block. Behind these doors and in these cells are men who don't belong in any prison. They are insane, psychotically insane. There's no room for them in the overcrowded state mental institutions. So they stay here, locked in their cells, day after day, month after month, becoming more insane year after year. There are no facilities here to treat the insane. The prisoners who aren't locked up all day consider working a privilege. To have and hold a job within these walls is vitally important. It is the prisoner's only possible escape from his barred cell. 
If a man cannot work, if no work can be found for him, then he must remain in his cell except for meals. Jobs are assigned to the inmate by the classification board. The chairs outside the board's hearing room are never empty. There are hundreds of idle men here who have nothing to do, who find themselves locked up all day, every day. Inside, the board faces the prisoner and tries to make Solomon-like decisions. The simple facts are there are not enough jobs. Some men just are not capable of doing the kind of jobs which are available. The board reviews and re-reviews its files, but there are just too many men. Once again, overcrowding takes its toll. But 2,500 men do work for seven and a half hours each day. Most of them work in eight small factories within the 22-acre prison. Each factory makes items used either by the prison or by other state institutions. The men make their own clothing in one factory and furniture for schools in another. Auto license tags are turned out here, as is electricity and heat for the state buildings downtown. The prisoners make eight cents an hour. Four cents goes to their families, two cents to a savings account, and they are allowed to spend the other two cents. In some ways, the work done by the prisoners is considered rehabilitation. But rehabilitation is a dirty word to most prison officials. They say there really isn't any such thing as rehabilitation in most of this country's prisons, and for the most part, they're right. But some men do learn things in prison that could help them to earn a living on the outside. But too often the jobs they learn here are done by machines on the outside. As one prisoner puts it, tell me where I'm going to get a job making auto license plates on the outside. Education is perhaps the single most important factor in changing a criminal. And it's usually the most neglected and poorly staffed program in our prisons. It varies. But across the nation, 75% of men in prison never graduated from high school, and the average prisoner never even got through grade school. Many cannot read or write. Whether you want to believe it or not, thousands turn to crime because they're not smart enough for anything else. Two desperate efforts are being made here to help these men. One is the Capital School, which is a grade school to teach men to read and write. There is one teacher, one classroom, and room for only 120 men in this school. The situation in the vocational school is even more discouraging. Here an attempt is made to teach men a trade they could use on the outside. Here too, there is one teacher and only room for 100 students. Generous businesses contribute the only machines and textbooks they have. The state contributes little. Besides the shops, this is the entire rehabilitation program. 200 men out of 4,000 who can go to school and learn a trade other than stealing. Every man has days in his life that he will never forget. Times and places that wash back over the memory and come to life in his mind again. For a man who lives here, who has existed here for 10 or maybe 20 or 30 years, the day he remembers most vividly is probably the day he came to prison. Yes, I remember very well. It was raining. We got here about dinner time. It was a cloudy, very overcast day. The men were just starting from the block to dinner. At that time, they marched very in a very military manner. Everybody dressed alike, and those long lines of men and music playing, it scared the hell out of me. And that first night in the cell, well, I was just lost. Usually the first year a man is much more aware of the things that he left in the free world, his wife or children or family. But after you're here a long time, uh, those things uh, really just further and further away. Well, he works seven and a half hours. Eating takes up another hour and a half. The rest of the time. I think unconsciously you know just exactly how big it is, how many steps there are from one end to the other. Not very many, four and a half, the way I step. You know how many bars or how many lattices, holes in the screen. You know quite a bit about your cell if you spend a few years in there. It's only big enough actually for two men, although there are four men in a cell. 
it's his home, if you can call it that, it's home. Well, just uh, a life of men without anything uh, to look forward to, lots of times it would scare anyone, or it should scare them. The lack of uh, any home-like atmosphere, the regimentation, the dirt, and it is dirty. You crowd 3,600 men in a place that was built for 2,200, it's bound to be dirty. Sundays and holidays are terrible, especially when you have two or three of them running together. Three long days. The men usually dread the holidays, especially in the winter, like our Christmas and New Year's. Christmas and New Year's is on a Tuesday. Sunday is a day that you lay in. The governor decreed that Monday would be a state holiday. The men spent Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday on their cell. That's an awful long time. I don't think you actually ever get used to it. I think the... Uh, the majority of the men suffer from uh, lack of initiative. It sort of drains you. You become more of a robot than a human being after you spend a long time in a cell. If what has gone before in this report seemed bad, then the worst is yet to come. It is here, here in these cell blocks, jammed beyond belief that the greatest crime is committed. For it is here that some men's minds and wills are destroyed. It is here that the night echoes out with sobs and cries of despair. It is here that men die and yet go on living. It is here that the chirping of the canary is everywhere. In almost every cell, there are canaries. The small yellow songbird is a symbol here. It is someone for the prisoner to talk to, to take care of, and even to love. Unceasingly, its strange song fills the musty air behind these prison walls. Most of the time a man is in prison will be spent right here in this steel jungle. No four human beings can live this close for years unnumbered. But these men do. They never have a single second of privacy. Everything they do and say is heard and seen by three other men. If he stands, the ceiling will be less than a foot from his head. He can only move back and forth. Four steps in either direction. And most of the time, he can't move at all unless three other men are on their bunks. Everything is one at a time. Two men cannot do anything in this cell at the same time except sit and sleep. He is caged, caged in a steel jungle like an animal. When hundreds of men Four men to a cell are crowded together this way for years. There is another problem that no one ever talks about. There is no possible sexual outlet in prison at all, except one, an abnormal one with other men. From the moment a man arrives here, he knows it. He fights it desperately. But in the end, some succumb because a man dying of thirst cares not if the water is polluted. He comes here normal, but he may not leave that way and he may come back as a parole violator because of it. This, too, is part of the awful crime of overcrowding. In his first few years here, a man battles the iron bars and the caging. At the end of a couple of years, some men are bitter, but a great many have learned whatever lesson they're going to learn. They are ready to leave here and never come back. But they still have years to serve on their sentences, and so they remain locked in, locked up, for years and years more. And this is where the mind and the will are destroyed. The signs are many. They begin with a loss of interest in anything, even in the desire to finish a checker game. Frustration steeps its way into a man's mind, and pretty soon he cannot even concentrate on finishing one paragraph in a magazine. And then the few things that did sustain him in the beginning become an irritation. A familiar song on the radio, or a beer commercial, or even a woman's voice depress him. He refuses to see any visitors, and he quits writing letters. He won't take the small amount of recreation time he's allowed. In the end, he may talk to a cellmate who left months ago, or go out for work in the morning without his shoes on. He is in a continual state of prison stupor. 
His eyes glaze and he stares, but sees nothing. The daydreaming in his cell now goes everywhere with him. He has fought the fight and lost it. When he gets out, if he ever does, he is a scared, frightened man who doesn't know how to act in front of people, make a decision, or even turn a doorknob. If he is still young and lucky, he may learn to exist on the outside like he did behind the walls. But he has learned little here that will help him. The best he can hope for here is to stay the same. No one rises above the prison system. The report on these men in this prison has necessarily been a negative one. There is not much about any of our ancient penitentiaries that is good, but this is not to say that nothing good has been tried. In new prisons, the overcrowding could be solved by single cells, which would obviously help control the sex problem. Newer facilities could educate men to grammar and high school levels and thus help them survive on the outside. The crimes these men committed cost the taxpayers of this nation billions of dollars a year in police, courts, and prisons. The cost of new prisons where men could be helped would be a lot cheaper. But make no mistake, new prisons won't make new men. Some men belong here. They will never learn. They will always commit crimes against the public. And a prison is a deterrent against crime. But prison without hope, prison without rhyme or reason, prison without a chance to learn to be something more than a criminal, prison that just cages men behind bars, this kind of a prison is a failure. Some of the changes necessary must come from outside these walls. A review of our laws and of the sentences handed out to these men is badly needed. A man who has learned his lesson and who prison officials feel is ready to go out should be paroled, not kept for years until he is worthless to everyone, including himself. What you have seen here is not a criticism of prison officials. Most of them have worked to make prisons better and have risked their jobs in doing so. How bad is the prison in your state? We don't know. What we do know is that fewer than one-third of the prisons in the United States meet the minimum standards of the Federal Bureau of Prisons. In the final accounting, prisons are the property of the people, and it is only within the power of our elected officials to change or improve them. During the night, along the cell blocks, the prisoners in these cells rake their steel cups across the bars to call for help. That help for these men can only come from you.